This is Climate One. I'm Greg Dalton. And I'm Ariana Brocious. Since the Industrial Revolution, the global north has sustained economic growth unlike any other time in history. And today, many understand continued growth to be the engine of a healthy economy. This is what we all sort of strive for. No one questions it. It's so deeply baked into our institutions, our thinking. Everyone's for economic growth across the political spectrum. It's unquestioned. And by and large, economic growth has been connected with rising greenhouse gas emissions. And we live on a planet with finite resources. That's why we're talking about growth today. Yeah, because it's pretty hard to believe that we can continue to consume resources at the rate we have in the global north and release emissions and not sail right past our collective climate goal of limiting global temperature rise to prevent worsening climate impacts. And it's not just about climate goals. There's lots of flashing red lights in our natural world these days that are saying we're in dangerous zones. Yeah, like the seventh extinction, right? Or just biodiversity loss in general. And it's hard to see how everyone on the planet could live the way you and I do. I have a hard time seeing that math add up. It's complicated to figure out what the right path is. And that's why some people are starting to rethink perpetual economic growth and the structure of the economy. There's a school of thought emerging in some circles called post-growth or degrowth, and sometimes those words are used interchangeably. One of its main ideas is finding ways to measure the health of an economy using metrics other than economic growth. So like a well-being index, for example. Which sounds a lot nicer than gross domestic product. I think the well-being just has a better ring to it. And importantly, proponents of this approach are focused on how we can have equity and prosperity while living within planetary boundaries, the real and firm environmental limits that humans can exist within. So we have to have clean air, clean water, sufficient land for agriculture, all these things that actually allow our species to live. And humanity depends on pollinators for producing food, forests for cleaning our water, trees for cleaning our air. We need services provided by nature to sustain all life on this planet, including our own. And that term, ecological services or services provided by nature, is one I really struggle with because I do think, while it's kind of accurate in describing how we depend on nature and the environment to help us live and thrive, it feels unfair. It feels like humans are centering themselves at the expense of anything else. Totally. It's like we have to put a price tag on something. If a tree serves a human, put a price tag on it, then we'll value it. There's no inherent value. I agree. There is something kind of strange about that. And yet, recognizing that there is this fundamental relationship between humans and their environment, some economists, academics, and activists are advocating for this philosophy, degrowth, as you'd mentioned, which is basically like a planned reduction of economic growth in some areas to help conserve the environment and address the climate crisis. And this is a really difficult area because let's face it, you know, growth slows, the stock market goes down, people get hurt, the economy slows. Uh, let's be honest, contributions to nonprofits, NPR, Climate One go down. We're all tied into this system that is all based on growth. And that's why it's really hard to talk about these things and people get really passionate. And sometimes these words of targeted growth, degrowth, post-growth mean different things to different people. And pinning down exactly what's being proposed can be difficult. To talk through these ideas, I had a conversation with climate and social justice activist Anuna DeVaver, who's an advocate for degrowth and decolonization. Joining the conversation is Lee Phillips, journalist and author of Austerity Ecology and the Collapse Porn Addicts. He's a critic of the degrowth movement. Anuna started the conversation by sharing her personal journey to embracing degrowth. Well, I've been a climate activist for a very long time, and it actually started with me being a human rights activist. And after a while, I started realizing that the climate crisis is the biggest human rights crisis of our century that we'll face, and maybe beyond if we don't actually get to solve it. And so for a very long time, also being a spokesperson of a movement, I've been in a lot of political debates with politicians, with journalists, with CEOs, with organizations talking about the different solutions that that we could use to actually battle the climate crisis. And none of them were systemic enough until I found degrowth. And degrowth looks at the combination of feminist theory, um, Marxist theory, uh, obviously anti-capitalism, uh, decolonization, anti-racism, a lot of the theories that I actually subscribe to and a lot of the theories that I think about when I think about the system that actually got us into this. And so recently I've heard about it, I've been looking into it, I've been studying it, uh, and I'm thinking and working around how to use that in my activism and how to actually strengthen the degrowth movement. 
what makes you happy, Anuna? And does capitalism deliver that for you? No, it really doesn't. And that's actually one of the things that I also see apart from all of the harm that capitalism is bringing onto our world globally and in Europe. Uh, capitalism also doesn't make me happy as an individual. The things that make me happy is the time that I get to spend with my family and friends and clean air, fresh water, a healthy planet, a secure future. And these are all things that are very insecure right now. And I am also a white European climate activist. I am in a very privileged position when it comes to the climate crisis. So even understanding how the system is harming me versus the rest of the world, uh, my generation and the other, art- other activists that I'm working with, this is just a very, very necessary topic for us to talk about. So again, thank you for having me. I'm, I'm really excited to be delving into this. Lee, do the material things produced by our capitalist system make you happy? I would say that the problems with capitalism is not so much that it makes me happy or unhappy. It's that there's a set of things that are useful, uh, which is larger than the set of things uh, that is profitable. If there's something that is beneficial but isn't profitable, there's no incentive in markets uh, to, uh, to to produce those those things. And conversely, if there is something that is that we know to be harmful but is profitable, there continues to be an incentive for those those goods or services to be produced. Right. I had a, a investment banker say to me once, who's diabetic, there's no financial incentive in curing diabetes because there's a profit incentive in selling him insulin every week and every day that he needs to put in his body. Do you think, Lee, that you consume too much? And do you ever feel bad about how much you consume? No, my God. It takes a level of extreme middle-class privilege to think that uh, Westerners, whether we're talking about Americans or Europeans, or Canadians in my case, consume too much. When 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, that for the last 40 years, uh, working class Americans, working class Europeans have suffered from nothing but austerity, uh, deindustrialization, stagnating wages in many sectors. If anything, I would like to see working class people earn a lot more uh, to be able to consume a lot more. I want to be able for everybody to have an, a nice life. I want to point out that we completely agree on that. I think only our conclusion is different. I think that it's very true that there's a lot of people in Western societies and wealthy countries that are living pay te- paycheck to paycheck, that are living in poverty, that are living in uh, energy poverty and crisis and insecurity. And that for me comes out of the conclusion that however much capitalism is producing and consuming all the time, it is still leaving so many people behind. And that's actually where I'm thinking okay, we clearly need to look at this system very critically and actually understand who are we growing this economy for, what is laying underneath our economy, and how do we change that? But understanding the the problems that also people in the West have with capitalism, I very, very much do. However, on a global scale, the 1%, and I'm not a part of that 1%, but the 1% consumes uh, 50% of everything. And that is and that is also a result of, of capitalism because capitalism is built for wealth accumulation. So that is just an organic result of what happens if we continue to live in this economic system. Right. So to lift everybody up, to lift everybody up to a decent standard of living, let's say like a middle-class um, Dane, somebody from Denmark, you know, we, all, we, we often talk about Denmark, Sweden, Norway, Finland being both very egalitarian but highly prosperous societies. So, so that's the sort of society or the level of standard of living that I like to see everybody in the world uh, have. For that to happen, Max Roser, um, our world in data, the, um, the sort of data visualization and statistics organization out of um, Oxford University, made a calculation recently that to give everybody in the world the standard of living of the average, uh, the average Dane uh, would require economic growth of about five times the current size of the global economy. So even though I do think that you, I, I think you're, you, you are absolutely uh, sincere when you say that you would like to see working class people in Europe and North America to live a, a good life and not have uh, austerity imposed on them anymore. But in order to achieve that, you have to have a lot more, a lot more economic growth. Even if we redistributed the wealth of the uh, the one percent, it would not be sufficient to lift every to, to lift everybody in the world up to a middle a nice sort of Danish middle class standard of living. So I think I mean first of all, uh, there's a lot of research, right? Because uh, there was uh, recent research actually published in Science Direct that said that we can live 
flourishing lives globally all around the world with 60% less of the resource use and 80% less of our energy use. So those are huge numbers in which we can actually look at what are we producing, what are we consuming, why does it take so much energy and resources, and how can we slim that in our economy? And again, I think that thinking if you just have more growth and more growth and grow more growth like we're doing now, eventually we're going to solve these issues uh, like classism. No, I think classism is created through capitalism. And that's where I find the analysis of thinking we're just going to continue to do what we do and hope that monopolies end and the wealth will be redistributed. And even then we need to grow our economy to redistribute even further on a global scale. First of all, there's a lot of science that contradicts that because we already have a lot of energy and wealth and resources that if we actually redistribute that and we have a democratic conversation about what we prioritize, we can live on a global scale with the things that we need and meet people's basic needs. And capitalism just doesn't provide that. No, we can't. No, we can't. Think about all the schools and hospitals, just those, just all the schools and hospitals that we would have to build in the global south to uh, to deliver that level of access to them. How much cement we would be having to produce, extra cement uh, uh, producing, how much extra electricity we would need uh, to power those, just those hospitals and schools. Um, and to say and to say that we uh, that we can do that without uh, that we can deliver all those services to people without an increase in economic growth is false. What is true is that we can become more efficient with our use of energy. We can be more efficient with our use of uh, of, of material resources. We can what what's called decouple economic growth from from resource use. And what we found is that you know there are uh, about thirty countries that have completely, absolutely, not relatively, uh, decoupled their emissions from their economic growth. And that's also true for a number of other sectors that we want to be we we might be concerned with beyond climate change. There are a range of different sectors. Uh, where there has been absolute decoupling, continued in economic growth in those sectors, uh, while the, uh, the the material and energetic use has has, has pla- plateaued or declined. I'll admit that coming into this interview, I thought that no country had decoupled economic growth from carbon emissions. That's the goal of economies to rise and emissions to decline. I'm chagrined to say when I looked into our world and data, many have decoupled. Most are industrialized economies in North America and Europe, also Estonia, Jordan, and some other emerging economies. So decoupling is happening on a country level. It has not yet happened on a global level. And Anuna, isn't that evidence that green growth is starting to work? Not at all. So the thing is, the question is not if we can decouple emissions uh, from GDP growth. We know that we can, but we cannot do that with the timeline of carbon budget, planetary boundaries and feedback loops and scale that we needed to do. There is simply no empirical evidence that proves that we can. If you're saying that green growth really works, absolute decoupling is working and green growth is working, our emissions are rising. We have crossed six out of nine planetary boundaries. The IPCC report said that in less than five years from now, we're going to cross our 1.5 degree threshold. And what we are seeing is that the renewable energies that we are generating to actually compensate for the energy that we need to grow our economy are just not coming fast enough since we are growing this economy, so we continuously need more energy and resources. And in that, we're also, we we keep talking about energy, but we also need to talk about resources. We do live in an economy that is built on white supremacy. And a lot of the trade and investment agreements that we have, especially in Europe, still have very big colonial dynamics built into them regarding raw materials. So when you're talking about growing our economy, do you also understand how much resources and raw materials that needs and where we're going to get that from? And I would suggest that uh, the working class people in those countries uh, might want de- economic development. And that in, uh, so take, for example, Canada and Australia, these are two um, developed countries uh, where they, you st- we still have a very, very large part of our economy devoted to mining. Now, thanks to decades of trade union struggle, of indigenous struggle, of, in fact, environmental struggle, in, in these two countries, there are very strong labor protections. There are good health and safety standards. There are good wages. For example, in northern Saskatchewan, uh, which is where most of North America gets its uranium for, for nuclear power from, uh, most of the workers in those mines are indigenous. Those, uh, they, are, uh, they are very good uh, paying jobs. They're community supporting, they're family supporting. Those First Nations, those indigenous people, are not calling for an end to mines. In fact, if uh, they put out, they regularly put out statements saying that they are concerned about the closure of nuclear power plants in the United States, organized by people like uh, the deep growth community and other environmentalists, uh, because it would result in a, a loss of jobs. 
progressive governments in Latin America are in favor of uh, extraction. But what they want is extraction where there are strong trade union protections, there are strong health and safety standards, and there's strong environmental standards. Once we have that, then there's nothing wrong with extraction whatsoever. You're listening to a Climate One conversation about a post-growth economy. If you missed a previous episode or want to hear more of Climate One's empowering conversations, subscribe to our podcast wherever you listen. And you can help us get more people listening and more people talking about climate by giving us a rating or a review. Or better yet, pick an episode you especially like, maybe this one, and send it to a friend. On our website, you can create playlists of all kinds of different episodes and share those with your friends as well. Coming up, what could degrowth mean for the global South? This means degrowth in wealthy nations that are currently extracting and exploiting developing nations so that we can grow the economies and develop the economies on a local and community level in countries in the global south that have for long suffered from these colonial legacies. That's up next. Let's get back to my conversation with Anuna DeVaver and Lee Phillips. Techno-switching is the idea that we can swap one technology for another to reduce emissions. For example, swapping your methane gas stove for an electric induction cooktop. Those kinds of changes are powerful and necessary. But some techno-optimists make it sound like techno-switching is all we need to do. And that avoids harder changes in our personal behavior, as well as our culture and economy that others think are necessary. Lee Phillips says techno-switching will be required of all of us. So the vast majority of greenhouse gas emissions come from vitally socially necessary activities, such as heating, electricity, uh, transportation, cement for the building of of homes, uh, schools, hospitals, and so on and so forth. So we have no choice but to technology switch. The question instead is, how does capitalism or how do markets potentially delay or inhibit that technology switching? And as I said earlier, um, if there is something that is uh, profitable and that is a benefit to us, then there's an incentive for, for that to happen. And so in some cases, that is happening already. The problem comes when we have technologies that they may be not be ready for prime time yet, that where they are sort of lab bench or, or, or startup or uh, research uh, level, or even and that needs to be taken through the valley of death to, to com- uh, competitive commercialization. For that to happen, we can't depend on market business as usual. And what we have to have is some sort of state intervention um, in the form of things like regulation or industrial policy. There are many different types of industrial policy or even public ownership uh, to be able to to cover that gap with that, that to de-risk the development of those technologies and move them through to, to uh, competitive commercialization. And the problem that we, we have had historically is that we've only, and why we have been so delayed in this is twofold. One is that we primarily focused on things like small tweaks to markets, such as carbon pricing, rather than much more robust um, intervention in the economy in the form of things like industrial policy. And I would say that the Inflation Reduction Act in the United States is a sea change in how we approach this, where there is now government incentives to develop these, these technologies, recognizing that markets left to their own devices will not solve the problem. So in many respects, that's a sort of socialist shift Anuna, your view on technology switching and industrial policy. Yeah, I mean, I think technology switching, technology development, renewable energies, all of those technological solutions we are going to need. What is my problem is that it seems to be the only thing that people constantly refer to that and decoupling on why we can just continue to do what we're doing and it's not going to be an issue. And every single time, again, I'm looking at emissions rising. I'm looking at planetary boundaries, carbon budget, feedback loops. IPCC reports, it's not getting any better. And also IPCC authors are saying that the technology that we will need to reduce emissions as radically as they need to be reduced does not exist. We had a, I I met a degrowth conference now in Zagreb actually, and there was a keynote yesterday from Diana Urge, who is an IPCC vice president of IPCC right now. And she was saying that by 2050, in the most optimistic economic growth scenarios, the vast majority of the world's population won't even have a refrigerator let alone us developing these kinds of technologies that are going to do the amount of carbon capture that you imagine. So my issue is just that I feel like we are constantly going back to these solutions to avoid 
look at the system that is actually causing it. And the system is intersectional. The system is big. The system is historical. I am a 22-year-old activist, and I'm trying to understand how all of this is fitting together. It's a huge thing. But what I am seeing is that my generation is willing to actually have the conversation, to actually dream about a different alternative reality. And we have been promised so many things for such a long time, and it's simply not working. So we are looking at different alternative economic systems, because at the end of the day, it is about our economic system that does need to change. And Lee, we talk about an energy transition, and reality is we've grown a lot of renewables, wind, solar, electric vehicles, but it's really been an energy addition. Those new technologies are fueling new demand. They're not displacing fossil fuels. EV adoption is not denting oil demand. So while we're deploying lots of renewables, that's really just feeding growth. It's not um, displacing fossil fuels in a way we need to reduce emissions. Would you agree with that, Lee? Well, I would say that you, I think you're looking at things too much at a global level. And uh, at a global level, it is true that emissions uh, and fossil fuel use are continuing to grow. But I would suggest that we return to the, uh, the, 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 the point that I made earlier about that there's 30 countries that have, or roughly 30 countries that have absolutely decoupled. And let's remember, it was only last year that the Inflation Reduction Act was passed. It's been one year. The European Union, for example, continues to overwhelmingly depend upon uh, market mechanisms. It's uh, its emissions trading scheme to drive through decarbonization. And I would suggest that the more that we push for industrial policy, the faster the, the decarbonization will happen. How do race and privilege play into the way you believe we should address the climate crisis? I think that's where democratization comes in. And that's also a part of degrowth, but that's also part of socialism, is that you look at who can actually be a part of this political debate and how can we make sure everybody has access to that. Degrowth is about selective degrowth. So this means degrowth in wealthy nations that are currently extracting and exploiting developing nations so that we can grow the economies and develop the economies on a local and community level in countries in the global south that have for long suffered from these colonial legacies. And on top of that, there's also a lot of people that are just excluded from that debate uh, entirely. I'm working a lot on the In My Name campaign, and it's a campaign for the regularization of undocumented uh, people, so people that are not even recognized as human beings in a country, and they are completely excluded from a debate that is actually very harmful to them because they are obviously very much touched by the consequences of the climate crisis. So for me, democratization in that is uh, is extremely important. And I have a lot of access to political debates, obviously. I'm literally sitting here with you having this debate on, on a big podcast. So I am hoping that there's going to be many more people around the world that deserve this platform to have this platform. Right. And now, Lee, how about your view of how race and privilege play into the way you believe we should address the climate crisis? I think that the there's a soft racism within a section of the climate left um within the degrowth community that uh, assumes that people in the developing world in the global south do not want to develop uh, that they um that, that extraction can only be performed in ways that are uh colonial it ignores what people in those the majority of people in those those regions and in those countries are actually saying uh, what they want. And that doesn't just go for people in the developing world, but also um, uh, people of color and indigenous people in the developed world as well. That uh, what we want, uh, what they want, which I think everybody wants, is good jobs that uh, support their communities, that support their families, that are intergenerational and sustainable uh, the, with health and safe, good health and safety protections. And so I would I would say that the best avenue for a, a reckoning with uh, questions of race and privilege and disparities and inequality is through the trade union movement, that I would love for the trade union movement to take um, over the climate discourse and steer the discourse towards the sort of industrial policy and technology switching and economic planning that, uh, that I've been talking about. We've been talking about degrowth, and certainly in the United States, defund the police is a political kiss of death. And degrowth has the same kind of branding problem for me that, like, people stop listening. So is degrowth, post-growth, are they the same thing to you? Would you agree that degrowth is a, a terrible term? 
As for the word degrowth, I think that where it came from is that there's been a lot of economic, well, new economic ideas, for example, the well-being economy, the care economy, circular economy, uh, donut economy, that in some way or another have been co-opted by capitalism and have not been controversial enough for people to actually start debating it in a systemic way. And I think the intention there was that degrowth would be controversial, not co-opted by capitalism for people to actually have that debate. And I do think we succeeded in that. But the question remains, does this need to be the term of the movement, the way that we're going to have these conversations? I don't know. I'm not very attached to it emotionally, to be honest. I think degrowth is many, many things. As I said in the beginning, I think it integrates a lot of the system thinking that I've been doing. And the word degrowth doesn't necessarily refer to that. So when it comes to actually having these conversations with movements, and by the way, I'm I'm doing that because I'm part of grassroots movements, also with a lot of indigenous movements and communities in the global south, these words are not necessarily centered in the conversation because it's just more about what does it actually mean for us and how are we going to get there? Anuna, you say people are stuck in a productivity trap. What is that? And what's an example of being stuck in a productivity trap? Yeah, what I mean with that is that our capitalist system requires us to grow our economy all the time. So we need to have labor that is productive. So people are constantly working and working. And we know this because we call this the red race, right? And also in my generation, I see that there's just so many people going into burnout. And I must admit, the climate movement isn't great at that either, because we also have a lot of people in burnout because we are obviously countering the system. So we're also working way too hard. But I think that this is a part of the conversation in degrowth. If you stop being obsessed with the fact that we need to grow GDP all the time and you reprioritize what is it, what do we actually need in this economy? What does actually make people happy? What does basic human needs actually mean on a global scale? Then you can also lower the, the labor hours and people don't have to work all the time to continue raising GDP. So for me, that's one of the one of the most fundamental things, because I feel like, and I, I, I see that in my circles, but we just know that from statistics, a lot of people are stuck in unfulfilling jobs. A lot of people are unhappy in the work that they're doing and the, the labor that they have to do every day to live from paycheck to paycheck. And this is something that also systemically and drastically and fundamentally needs to change. And at the same time, I think that Lee might also agree on that analysis, but not necessarily then on the conclusion. Lee, your response? I would say that I, I mean, I'd like a four-day work week. I think that's a great idea, so long as there's no loss in pay. But I just don't see how we're going to build out all of the huge amount of clean energy infrastructure. The estimates are between you know a doubling and a quadrupling of the current energy infrastructure in able to electrify. Everything needs to be electrified and the other sort of processes of decarbonization beyond electrification. So if anything, there's going to be a lot more work that needs to be done uh, over the next 20, 30, 40 years uh, to build out all that, that infrastructure. It needs to be done in an egalitarian fashion. I want to see less burnout, for sure. I want to see a shorter work week and higher pay. But again, if you do all that, if you, if you shorten the work week to four days a, work, a week without any loss in pay, uh, that would pro put a lot more money in uh, working class people's pockets. So they would spend a lot more money on many more things. Uh, surely that's that would result in economic growth. Certainly the build out of all the, uh, the infrastructure that uh, I was just talking about will also require, uh, and it is probably the, the uh, biggest burst of economic growth in, in human history to build all that infrastructure out in the next 20 to 30 years. And then finally, I would just say that um, uh, in response to the, the 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 argument that capitalism requires growth, socialism requires growth as well. Uh, to build again, to build out all the public schools, the, the public uh, hospitals, the public clinics, the public energy uh, systems, the public uh, railroads, and so on and so forth. All of those non-capitalist bits of infrastructure uh, need to grow as well if we're going to deliver a decent standard of living to everybody. So socialism also requires um, economic growth. Certainly the climate transition requires an enormous amount of economic growth. This is about shifting, right? We have so many people and so much uh, resources and energy and labor going into uh, corporations like Amazon, Apple, Shine, Coca-Cola. And that is not; those are not the things that are making people happy. So it's about Shifting that labor, shifting those energies, shifting those resources, and again, reprioritizing what do we actually need. For example, the fast fashion industry, we have enough clothes right now to clothe six generations of human beings. 
And we keep producing and producing and producing more. We keep using resources, energy, labor to do that for things that nobody needs. And that is what degrowth is about. It's having a conversation about what is a priority here. All of the things that we are producing, all of the resources, all of the energies, all of these things that are also, again, uh, crossing all of these planetary boundaries, we are not even able to provide people with basic human needs. Lee, what about GDP as the sole measure of human progress and prosperity, and what might replace GDP? Well, again, I'm a socialist, so I, I, I've, I've no particular attachment to that particular metric. I mean, I think there's lots of other metrics we could use, but uh, the question isn't so much the metric is whether we need in agri- open-ended, bounded, unbounded um, economic growth to to steadily allow for human progress. Do you believe there are planetary boundaries? that uh, people say that, you know, we just can't hammer and extract from the earth 8 billion people living like the three of us, frankly, doesn't work? Well, I've said before that um, we've seen in a number of sectors and a number of countries that we've achieved absolute decoupling. So yes, you can. We've already proven that we can continue to expand the standard of living of people while absolutely uh, decoupling their resource uh, use. Once energy use is decarbonized, then it doesn't really matter how much we uh, expand it by. We focused on the disagreements, but I actually think you agree uh, quite a bit. Climate's a real problem. We need fundamental change in the economy. So Anuna, what do you hear from Lee that you agree with? I agree with the fact that you're saying that you do feel there needs to be a systemic social and political uh, change. And I don't hear that a lot in the conversation that I'm having about degrowth. So I appreciate you saying that. And I think that's true. Also, because you're a socialist, obviously, you're not a diehard capitalist. I can see that. And I think that that's also where we agree, where we do need to redistribute and we do need to invest in the commons. And we do need to make sure that everybody globally, any Western societies have access to uh, human basic needs. We just disagree on how to get there, but I think the intention is is the same. And Lee, what have you heard from Anuna that you agree with? Yeah, I would sort of reflect um, that back to her in that um, she's very clearly an egalitarian, a socialist, very concerned about racism and colonialism. Uh, these are all my uh, sort of um, pet issues as well, that she believes in, in uh, the, the the scientific evidence for anthropogenic global warming. There's so much that we do agree on, uh, but I do <laughs> I do I also agree with her uh, on her diagnosis that uh, we just disagree on the, the path uh, out of that problem. Lee Phillips, Anuna DeVaver, thank you so much for sharing your passionate ideas and differences here on Climate One. No worries. Thank you. In 2012, economist Kate Rayworth came up with a theory called donut economics, which is another variation on post-growth philosophy. It sounds delicious, but it has nothing to do with fried dough. It's just a helpful image to help think through this approach. Let's hear Rayworth explain donut economics in her own words. And this audio is courtesy of Ross Harrison. I tried to draw a picture of the world that we want to live in, and it Silly though it sounds, it came out looking like a donut, an American one with a hole in the middle. So imagine a donut, there's the outside and then there's the inside and there's that hole in the middle. In the hole in the middle, that's a space of deprivation, a space of shortfall where people don't have the resources to meet the essentials of life, like they don't have enough food or education, they don't have access to electricity, enough income, they don't have decent housing. So it's a space of shortfall and we want to get people out of that hole in the middle into the donut. But we want to do that for the whole world making sure that we also don't go beyond the donut's outer crust because that's a space of ecological overshoot where humanity puts more pressure on the planet than the planet can take and we start causing climate change or massive loss of biodiversity. We start creating a hole in the ozone layer or polluting Earth with chemicals that we add to it. So we need to both get people out of deprivation and poverty but also protect Earth and protect these fundamental life-supporting systems that keep us alive. Those are the two sides of human well-being, the inside and the outside of the donut. And the 21st century challenge is a unique one. It's to get everybody out of poverty while coming back in at the same time. That's never been taken on before. And that's partly why we need to rewrite economics because it's a completely new way of looking at what human well-being is. Rayworth has since started the Donut Economics Action Lab to help implement her ideas in cities, countries, and businesses around the world. And the first place to implement some of those principles was the city of Amsterdam. 
After the break, we'll hear from Marieke van Dornink, who was deputy mayor of Amsterdam and the driving force behind the city's adoption of donut economics. She tells us what it was like to bring new ideas to city policy. It's about so many other things than about consuming and about getting money. So I think it really helped people to think about that we need new solutions for the problems that we're dealing with. We'll be right back. It's one thing to talk about ideas that could be implemented. It's another to actually try and implement them. Amsterdam was the first city to adopt donut economics into city policy, and they started during COVID-19. I talked with Marika van Dornink, who was deputy mayor for the city of Amsterdam when the donut policies were adopted. She says it began with Amsterdam's high sustainability goal. Amsterdam had high ambitions on sustainability when I started in 2018. Uh, It was said that we had to reduce 55% of our CO2 emissions. So that was a big ambition. So when I was looking at the options I had to do that, most of the options very, very technical. So actually what you do is you... Yeah, you replace one fuel for the other, for a fossil fuel, and you make it into a biofuel or a synthetic fuel. Um, You're looking at cars, you go from a motor car to an electric car. And actually, just by changing one fuel system to the other actually doesn't solve all the problems. And, And one of the problems that you could extra have is that all these solutions were quite expensive. So... Those who can afford to live sustainable could do that. They could buy an electric car. They could have the solar panels on their roof. But a lot of people couldn't. And you could create some kind of eco-elite where the problems of inequality, which is also a big crisis in, in many countries in the world, and, and Amsterdam has no exceptions, wouldn't be solved by that. And at the same time, also this kind of what we call green growth, where actually we keep on growing and we keep the same economy that we have. We just do it in a green way. It uses a lot of natural resources like cobalt and lithium. And we also know that we also run out of these resources. So the ecological crisis that we have, that, you know, the damage done by all this mining of these minerals would actually not get better, but would get worse through uh, only looking at getting sustainability by all these uh, new techniques. So we knew we had to look for uh, for something else. And that was really in the way that we produce and that we consume. Our economy is based on growth. If our economy doesn't grow, we're immediately in a recession. And, and that makes that we keep on producing and producing and, and things are made to be broken. Things are made to grow out of fashion very fast so that we can buy new stuff to keep the economy growing. And if, if we are honest to each other, that, that this system, that this indefinite growth on a finite earth is just no longer sustainable because it takes too much of our planet and it takes too much of our people, like thousands and millions of people who live under very bad labor conditions because of this, this overconsumption this addiction uh, to growth. Uh, But for a long time, we all were told that there is no alternative. This is the only economic model. So when I read about Kate Rayworth, Donut Economies, I really thought there is an alternative. There is another economic model that we can actually use where we can fight the two crises that we're facing, the the crisis of inequality that is growing and the crisis of climate and the crisis of biodiversity loss and the crisis of the ecological disasters that we're having. So for me, it was really looking at the problem, not from one side, just the sustainability, but really from both the social and the ecological side. So you've touched on this idea of slowing growth or reconsidering the perpetual growth that we've seen the world over in terms of the economy. What do you think about the concept of degrowth? I think that we need to go towards a direction of degrowth because we can't keep on growing. That the, Our earth doesn't provide enough resources to keep on growing and, and our social system doesn't have the foundation to, to, to keep on growing. And actually, we don't need to keep on growing. We have in, in the Western world, we have enough wealth to live the way we do. We need to distribute our wealth in a better way. And actually, the things that are are not growing at the moment are the most important. It's our health. It's our well-being. It's our community life. Those are the things that are actually 
left behind in this in this idea of economical growth. So the idea of degrowth is not about recession. The idea about degrowth is really what's after growth. So that's why I like the term post-growth very much. It's about, so now that we have grown, what do we do? We can't keep on growing. We have to stabilize. We have to look for where do we go next? And you know, when people think that if we stop growing, we get recession, I think what we need to say is after growth, you get flowering, you get blossom. Then I think we need to learn how to blossom. Yes. Lovely picture there. So how did donut economic principles end up being adopted in Amsterdam? We connected it to the circular strategy of Amsterdam, so very much on circular economies, which is not as, um, let's say, revolutionary as, as donut economies, but something that, that most cities are working on when it comes to sustainability. So we linked the two and said we want to do something extra because if I had wanted to you know, to have the donut in all aspects of the city, I think I would still be talking to a lot of people and they they would be scared to go that far. So we decided just to start with those issues that we have most influence on and see if we can start there. So what we did was looking at three main issues where there's a huge amount of materials going on and actually materials where Amsterdam had also a say over. So we were looking uh, at the at the three aspects on construction, on food and consumer goods. So we were really looking at what is our impact right now in those issues and how can we change that? For example, Amsterdam needs to build a lot of houses because we do have a housing crisis here, but we know that construction is extremely polluting. So now that we're, we're constructing houses and we try to use as much wood and other natural materials uh, as possible. So we put that in the demands of those who are building in Amsterdam, that there's a really high uh, level of demands when it comes to sustainability and not only in the uses of energy, but also in the materials that are being used in the building. And at the same time, we ask builders to make a passport of the house. So if there comes a time when things need to be repaired, you know you can easily repair that house, or even when it needs to be deconstructed, you can take everything apart and then use it for a new building. That's remarkable, honestly. That's a really exciting concept. So I just want to clarify, are these things that are actually in policy in law in some form that are requirements of builders or are they recommendations? Uh, some of them are requirements. Many of them are requirements and some of them are uh, recommendations. But in the way we build in Amsterdam, we do it with tenders. So you get a lot of points if you if you do it in a circular way. So a lot of the builders want to do that. So it is both on the materials used, but also on what we call nature inclusive. So to make sure that, for example, birds can nest in housing, the surroundings around the urban areas are still places where also animals can live or also places where important uh, fauna can flora can be there. So it's really about adding something to nature instead of doing it instead of the nature uh, that is already there, or even places where there is no nature at this moment. For example, an old industrial area, which is then being transformed into a neighborhood, we add a huge amounts of green to enhance biodiversity in those uh, in those areas. The other thing that I that I really like is that we also have what we call a material bank. So if if there's places where houses or other buildings are being deconstructed, there's a register where you have to say where the windows go and where the doors go. So actually, if somebody is building, they can actually look at um, what is in the register and what can I reuse again so that I don't have to get new materials. That's really interesting. There are some small scale models of that I can think of in the US, like the organization Habitat for Humanity, which will acquire donated materials and, and sell them at a discount to people who are looking, but it's not as formalized as what you're describing. So that's a positive example. Can you help us understand where implementation of this has been the most difficult? Well, there's a few things that makes it difficult. And, and one of them is the way that a government organization is being set up. And it's very sectorial. So it's really, you have the social sector, you have the environment sector, you have the building sector. And the donut, of course, is a very holistic model. It really tries to get all these different elements that are that are causing the crisis in, in the world to put them together to address all of them. So 
within policies, it's quite difficult to put them all together. Uh, and actually also sometimes the benefits from a policy don't land, let's say, or don't are, are not very much seen in the sector that is paying the most most of the prices for the advantages because the benefit is maybe more social or ecological than the departments within the city that's actually building the houses. So we, we really have to also have a more, let's say, holistic or integrated way of governing the city to really implement a good donut, to do it in a holistic way. What I like about the donut is really you can start right away. We have so many examples in Amsterdam where actually it's not the government, but it's just communities small businesses, enterprises that are doing donut deals, that are actually putting those ecological boundaries and those social foundations together and start up. But if you really want to do it thoroughly and, and, and get into the donut, you would also need some more systematic changes. And I think one of the most important is our tax system. Right now, the taxes on labor are pretty high. And taxes on, on primary resources like, you know, newly mined materials are still far too low to really compensate for all the damage that raw resources are doing. So we need a big shift from labor to consumption or to, to using raw materials. And that's something that the city of Amsterdam can't do. This is something that we need to do on a, on a national level or even at an EU level. Could you provide one quick example of what a community has done? One of the examples that we have is that it's a community in, in the southeast part of Amsterdam. And the southeast is a rather poor and, and uh, challenged neighborhood of Amsterdam. And there's a community, they uh, said, we need to get a sustainable heating system for our houses because right now everything is on natural gas. But we don't want to be dependent and, and pay for a very expensive model. So what we want to do is we want to build our own digester system from old food, but also from, from the gutter and to see if we can build this our, ourselves. And it's a huge plan and they started step by step. So they now have a big food digester, where also some of the small restaurants in the neighborhood and the shops in the neighborhood are distributing their old waste food and other waste products. So they already are producing some gas right now. It's it's quite difficult, but they're doing it. So actually the idea is, is people have something together, a little enterprise together for which they uh, have their own cheap energy for their neighborhoods. But of course it takes a long time and there's more problems in the neighborhood. So they started by also looking at the houses and say, those are very bad isolated. So they bought some sewing machines and gave some sewing lessons to some of the people who were unemployed in the neighborhood. So people started sewing curtains for the neighborhood. And that was a good insulation. And at the same time, people would have an income by sewing those curtains. So it's it's really small things, but it's it's both increasing a community in a neighborhood where people are helping each other. It creates small jobs and it creates a sustainable way of heating uh, heating the houses. That's really great. That's a, that's a lovely example. What role did the COVID crisis play in the adoption of donut economics? Well, actually, when we were designing it, we were we were looking forward to the launch and um, forward to all the discussions we would have about that. And just a few weeks before the launch, COVID crisis hit the city and hit hit the world. And uh, we were really discussing whether we should launch it because nobody was thinking about economics people were thinking about their health people were thinking about their their businesses uh, afraid to to go out of business because everything was closed down in, in in the lockdown so there was no room you would think of talking about donut economics and in the end we decided to do it so I had an, an interview with Kate Rayworth a, a double interview in in the Guardian and it immediately went wild and I think it was because of the COVID crisis that People in, in such a crisis where when you are back to what is the most important to you and it's about health and it's about your social context, but people you couldn't see anymore. It's about so many other things than about consuming and about getting money. So I think it really helped people to think about that we need new solutions for the problems that we're dealing with. So actually it became maybe much bigger because of the crisis, because people were looking for answers and knew that we couldn't 
find those answer in old economical models that had failed us already. And at the same time, we had some of the donut projects that we did were actually invented in, in, in COVID times. Uh, we noticed quite soon that everybody was dependent, of course, on a laptop or on, on an iPad or some of devices where you could communicate in order to go to school or in order to, to other things. And we noticed that a lot of people, due to financial problems, didn't have uh, these means of communication. So what we did was to collect old laptops from from the city. And we had them refurbished by people who who didn't have a job and who uh, had some kind of distance to the labor market. And then we distributed them amongst those people who, who had financial problems and were in isolation. And actually, it's a program that is still running. What's been the most important realization you've had since the adoption of the donut model in Amsterdam? I think if you really want to change things, start doing it and maybe not wait for the perfect moment, but really collect a group of people who are willing and who are ready to change and start start changing uh, things and, and make sure that actually communities, people who, who want to make those changes need to be supported because I think change in the end comes from the people doing it and not by government telling people to change. Marika van Dornick is former deputy mayor for the city of Amsterdam and director of Kennisland. Thank you so much for joining us on Climate One. It was my pleasure. On this Climate One, we've been talking about rethinking economic growth. Climate One's empowering conversations connect all aspects of the climate emergency. To hear more, subscribe wherever you listen. Talking about climate can be hard and exciting and fascinating, all sorts of things. And it's critical to address the transitions we need to make in all parts of society. Please help us get people talking more about climate by giving us a rating or review. You can do it right now on your device. You can also help by sending a link to this episode to a friend. What do they think about growth? On our new website, you can create and share playlists on any topic you're interested in. By sharing, you can help people have their own deeper climate conversations. Greg Dalton is our host and executive producer. Brad Marshland is our senior producer. Our managing director is Jenny Park. Austin Colon is producer and editor. Megan Basilia is production manager. Wensi Sheida is our development manager. And Ben Testani is communications manager. Our theme music was composed by George Young. Gloria Duffy is CEO of the Commonwealth Club of California, the nonprofit and nonpartisan forum where our program originates. I'm Mariana Brocious.